thank you very much. Uh, we've got uh, 40 minutes for quite a robust discussion. The, the previous conversation on this stage uh, was hydrogen and how it can apply to the, to the mining sector. And we're looking here at the value chain and the different on-take of hydrogen in different corners of the world. Uh, in the last three years, for somebody who covers energy, you can see the money flowing into the sector in a very, very big way, but it's not one size fits all around the world. Uh, Intercontinental Energy is a, a, a player that's been around since 2014 with the mandate to develop uh, the sector. Uh, Alicia, do you want to give us a sample of what you're doing in different parts of the world? It gives us uh, an opportunity to look at the partnerships being developed and is it easier in certain parts where people understand it, uh, there's a desire to do so. And then we can talk about the cost and the challenges thereafter. But tell us from your vantage point, what's been the experience so far in the last eight years? Sure. Um, so when we set out uh, to start the company, we were very much interested in coastal deserts. We had realized that the cheapest places to make green electrons are coastal deserts, like Oman, uh, parts of Saudi, uh, Australia, North Africa. And the reason is that you get this um, diurnal profile where you have lots of sun during the day and a lot of wind at night. Um, and that means that you have constant power, which is one of the bane of, of, of renewables is the intermittency. So you really want to have this ability to have two different types of renewables that offset each other that are coming on at different times. And that means you have a constant source of power, you need a lot less storage, and everything is cheaper. Economies of scale also make a big difference. So it means you mean large pieces of land that are very uniform, very flat. Um, and then the, the price becomes something that people can actually afford to switch to. Um, so I find that, uh, because the countries that we're working in realize that they have these special resources, the, the countries are obviously very supportive of uh, developing it. Um, and because our, our projects are so large, our, our smallest project is 25 gigawatts. Um, in fact, it, it's in Oman, and we just announced on Monday that Shell has entered that partnership with us. Um, and BP, a couple months ago, um, entered the partnership of our first project in Australia, which is 26 gigawatts. Mm. Um, and we, uh, one of the good other things is that in all of our locations, there is also industry that can use uh, green hydrogen. It doesn't have to all be um, exported. But at some point, we would get to a, a stage of a circular economy because you know, in one of these 25 gigawatt projects, we'll be putting up 1,700 wind turbines. 1,700, 220 meter tall wind turbines. And right now, if you order a wind turbine, you are, the base is just rolled steel and you're shipping air. It's the steel is rolled and you're shipping it. And ideally what we would be doing is providing hydrogen to uh, steel makers and buying green steel from them to roll our own turbines and really create a circular economy for these areas. Very interesting. We have to circle back too, as something to think about for the panel, uh, the role of government, which I think is interesting in different corners of the world as well. What are the right policy mixtures and does it follow the pathway of what you did in solar and wind where government policy really made a difference in terms of entry points into the, to the market? R.K. Goyal, you're from Kalyani Steel. Uh, you've got your first uh, green hydrogen plant up and running uh, in Pune. Do you want to explain that uh, process and why you were able to pull it off? Because steel is intensive, right? So yeah. give us a sense of what that journey looked like. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, we have set up the first green steel plant in the country. But it's not based on hydrogen. It's based on electric arc furnace. And we use 100% renewable energy. We have another steel plant, which is an integrated steel plant. There we start with iron ore. Now, there, there is a challenge. Currently, all over the world, iron ore is reduced by carbon monoxide using metallurgical coke or by gas reformer process. There it is carbon monoxide plus hydrogen. So, for a steel industry, for an integrated steel plant, when you want to start with iron ore, we definitely can 
convert that into direct reduced iron using hydrogen. Now, typically, the challenges are we require continuous supply of hydrogen, and then the basic uh, agenda of green steel is to start from green energy. So we have to use either solar, hydel, or wind energy, produce hydrogen, and a very large quantity of hydrogen. Just to give a perspective, it requires almost 65,000 tons of hydrogen for a million ton of steel. And it requires almost 2 gigawatt of green energy to produce 1 million ton of DRI. That raises a question, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I think, it, I think people in the audience would probably be saying it's probably too expensive to do it in steel. Is this just an experiment for Kalyani, or can it be competitive very quickly if you no. can? You see, as, as far as our current, uh, one, one of the steel plant which is based on our furnace is concerned, it is producing 100% green steel. It is of a small capacity of around 250,000 tons. But in the process, we could reduce the cost. So it is at a reduction of cost. And when I say integrated steel plant, where you require almost a billion dollar to produce green energy, renewable energy, there, yes, we require a billion dollar in energy, but overall there will be a cost reduction. So it has several advantages. Yes, uh, you, on one hand you have high capex, but other hand, your overall cost, even after considering cost of money, will be lower. You will be producing close to zero carbon dioxide, and for countries like India, where 100% or 90% of metallurgical coke, as well as uh, coking coal is imported, will not be required. And uh, 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 company will become self-independent. It will be independent in terms of energy. And it's, uh, it will generate fairly large employment also. Right. So decarbonization has brought in great opportunity for a country like India. Yeah, I know, and I know the pathways that you're trying to go to now to net zero 2060, or is it 70? It is 70, that's the yeah. challenge. I actually went into your coal pits in, uh, in various parts of the country, and there's almost an addiction to coal because you need so much energy, so I commend you on the pathway uh, to green hydrogen. Marcello, you wanted to pick up on this thought uh, in the application for steel. Vale is a gigantic commodity player globally, but. Uh, Brazilian base. What are your what are your views here on the pervasiveness on the use of hydrogen today? And I think Grisha can address that as well from Shell and that cost perspective in terms of uh, the different points around the world as well. Please. Okay. Well, I, I think it, we don't have a you know a silver bullet for that. So I think we should bring two perspectives for that. So first one, as you mentioned, uh, Grisha, that we have a, a portfolio of solutions. And actually, we can say that we have a pathway to the decarbonize steel industry. So if you consider from our perspective, we are a mining business. We see our scope three as a huge challenge. So what is the common sense of the pathway in a global view? So more than 70% of the production today use the blast furnace and the, and the coal as a part of a source of energy. So we see the first moment, optimize this, use less coal and migrate to direct reduction routes. That, that's exactly what we, we, we are doing there. And he's in the final solution that we believe that we need to use natural gas the first moment, that we can reduce 60% of, of CO2 emissions. We may consider the carbon capture that my friend here can call, to tell us how is this, and actually this region is, can, can be part of that. Natural, uh, nature-based solutions also can offset this. And finally, migrate to, to hydrogen as we, we bring in a, you know, in a competitive way. So that's the pathway we leave. And actually, I believe in by 2050, all of this together. So this is one perspective. Other perspective is about a, a redesign of the supply chain in the world. So we will need to support this route, high-grade wars. So yesterday, we saw many of our competitors here, they're not talking about Code 3 a lot because they don't, they don't have high-grade ores. Valley is in a very good position for that. And I'm not only proud of that, but we have a problem because we don't have enough. So we have to you know, improve that production of high-grade ores. How do you see the supply chain? So 
One thing that it's, it's a trend as one of the, the, the most important part, there's a reduction part that you produce in Europe or in Asia with the blast furnace, we can produce HPI, a hot brick iron, using natural gas and later hydrogen in this region. So Saudi Arabia is and will be in the future the powerhouse of this business. So we cannot only transport and send hydrogen or ammonia around the world, but we can send iron, green energy, or blue energy inside the steel and supply the world. So you can keep the downstream operations in Europe to supply BMW, but you can use this hot briquette. That is very good in terms of CO2 emissions. So again, there will be an offshoring process, oh. uh, bringing allocation of energy source uh, good logistics and high-grade ore to support that. that. That's what we are designing, and that's the way we see uh, multiple solutions in your future. Uh, Richard, do you want to jump in on the role of Shell, for example, even with Intercontinental? I think it was interesting that Shell and BP, who as oil and gas producers were literally on the early pathway uh, to diversification of their portfolios today, and how do you see this uh, development of hydrogen? One of the topics we wanted to, uh, to address in the panel, you can, you can start on that process too, is can we get to net zero by 2050 with uh, hydrogen having a very strong role? I know it's early days, but do you want to bring that into the conversation as well? Yeah, thanks, John, and <clears throat> thanks for inviting me to the panel. And Alicia, great to be your partner uh, since, <laughs> since Monday this week. Um, we had to split you guys up on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. A bromance, sister mans, whatever yeah. you want to call it. <laughs> Indeed. No, but it, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a good question that you also asked, um, John, because I get that question a lot also here at the forum. Why is Shell actually focused on mining? Why is Shell focused on decarbonization? Why is Shell on a hydrogen panel? People still have, lots of people still have the image of Shell of, of being um, an oil and gas company. Uh, and, and, and while we still have that arm, uh, uh, which is transitioning out over time, we are actually becoming more and more of an energy company, uh, which is trying to work with its customers to decarbonize them. Because we have set ourselves a net zero target as well, not just for scope one and two, but also for scope three. And, and that's more than 90% of our emissions. So we're working hand in hand with our customers. and. On, on helping them to decarbonize. And hydrogen is, is, is one of the solutions in this mosaic of solutions that uh, Marcelo just mentioned as well. Uh, it will be uh, a critical enabler in the future um, to get the world to net zero, but it does have some challenges to overcome indeed. And, and, and one of them is cost, as you mentioned. Um, at the moment, if you look at it for the last two decades, other energy carriers were more in the focus uh, gas as a transition fuel, um, electrification, biofuels, um, and uh, a lot of advancements were made in hydrogen, a lot of research, a good of, uh, development, first pilot uh, projects, and so on. But it has um, failed yet to get commercial acceptance with customers, um, and that's because the cost is too high yet. Uh, so it, it will come, its time will come, but we have to get the cost down, and the cost can only get down if we develop economies of scale, um, and, and uh, that requires, uh, on the one hand, um, developing, uh, having the right policies, having um, yeah, investments, but also uh, de-risking investments. Um, RK just mentioned uh, um, uh, the importance not just of, of, of the steel manufacturers, for instance, in that, in that uh, if you want to produce green steel, it's also the off-takers, it's the, the miners, it's the whole value chain that needs to come together uh, and to build coalitions of the willing to help de-risk all the investments required because at the moment it's still quite costly. And that will then help to drive um, economies of scale and, and, uh, and economies of scale will help to get the cost down. And, and so it cannot be just green hydrogen that we focus on because there will be a lot of demand for renewable energy, for electrification. And hydrogen, green hydrogen requires a lot of uh, uh, power, green, uh, uh, renewable power as well. So we need to make sure we are also open to other solutions like, uh, like um, other forms of, uh, of, of decarbonized hydrogen, so blue hydrogen, where you, uh, um, uh, to our case point, where you basically leverage carbon capture technology, 
mm. uh, in the process uh, to help drive economies of scale in the end that is required. The end game needs to be green hydrogen, but in the meantime, we will also need to be open to other decarbonized hydrogen solutions as well. Okay, I'm going to open up the panel to uh, some questions, and I'm just going to invite you all to pick up and, and play with it. Uh, one of them, and is it even apropos for the mining industry if you're far afield and you don't have the infrastructure? One of the points you were making in our conversation uh, in the green room there, Alicia, was that it's good for a fixed position, but if you're a miner going into different facilities, you don't know how long it's going to be, the exploration process. Does it work for mining? Uh, is it just the downstream play or not? How do, how do you see it? Well, I think <clears throat> hydrogen has always been the promise of mobility um, for green electrons because you, other than AC lines or, you know, cables, undersea cables, it's very hard to move electricity around. So hydrogen was the, this is how we bottle it up and, and send it somewhere else. As it turns out, hydrogen is not that easy to transport. It's not that easy to store. Mm. Um, but if you take a little bit of nitrogen from the air and you combine it and make ammonia, it is very easy to transport and to store and to use. You, you don't even have to crack it back to hydrogen in a lot of cases. Isn't that what Aram you're doing with Aramco? What's the plan here? Um, all of our projects are basically the same. Uh -huh. um, it's the same concept. The, the land areas have a very similar profile. Um, but yeah, what we would be doing is, is the same, which is um, all of the upstream wind and solar uh, is used in order to desalinate seawater and then split that water with electrolysis into hydrogen and oxygen, and then add uh, nitrogen from the air using a very old Heber-Bosch process, and to make ammonia, which you can then export. But let's take the Saudi example. Um, there's lots of industry nearby, steel making that wants to be green. There's um, Madden wants to be greener. There's lots of industry in Eastern province that could be greener either with electrons or the hydrogen. Um, so there's a, a local market as well before you get to the downstream well, um, shipped out export market. Great. Uh, in 10 years time, would you say, RK, that uh, hydrogen, the Kalayani model will be pervasive in India at least uh, with this green hydrogen steel? I think the way research is going on, a lot of R&D work is going on globally. Number two, steel sector is topmost priority sector because it generates 7% of global CO2 Maybe. in the world. Mm. So it's a topmost priority sector, easier to be done as compared to many other industries. And the way work is going on, I will not be surprised if we are able to do by 2030 and in the next decade, most of the plant switch over to hydrogen based steel or green steel. Hmm. So it's, it's not very far off. I don't see. And uh, at the same time, almost 30-40% uh, steel even on date is produced by electric arc furnace. In India, it is almost 50%. That can be de decarbonized. All this can be converted into green steel pretty quickly. Now it's an issue related to investment where the respective governments of the various countries need to take a decision how to support this movement. Mm. But it is on the topmost priority. Another thing is in relation to this, which is uh, not in steel, but in aluminum. Like, uh, uh, typically in steel, you uh, consume around a thousand, uh, sorry, three ton of carbon dioxide. In aluminum, it is almost 16 to 18 ton of carbon dioxide. So that's another major sector. And that's another area where hydrogen can play a big role, RE can play a big role to convert that again to the green energy. Mm -hmm. In fact, after our success in steel, now a lot of uh, aluminum manufacturers in the country, they are approaching us whether we can support them to produce green aluminum. Good. What are you going to do with all that coal in the country then? Pardon? You have 100 years or 150 years of coal supply. You just let it stay in the ground, it would probably be the preference. See, how we are changing coal, coal to something which is available abundantly, the solar power, which is available, which yeah. is free of cost. Yes. Even coal is not free. 
Now it's a matter of converting solar power into energy which can be used and it improves the life of everybody because you have a cleaner air. Yeah, for sure. No, you see, we just... always forget about the investment or the expenditure on the health care. Now, because of the high level of pollution, you may be hearing about few cities in the country, the people are falling sick, the uh, expenditure on uh, that uh, uh, medical and pharma industry are very high. So this is another very large indirect saving for the government. Good. Can we talk about the pathways then in different parts of the world, Marcello and, and uh, Grisha? Do you want to uh, discuss how the take up will be in the next 10 years? Which market share would hydrogen make up for your production, for example, in 10 years time? I'm trying to get a sense of what the percentages will look like, or is it too early to even uh, go down that path? And maybe Alicia can jump in afterwards, but go ahead, Marcelo and Grisha first. You know, the, um, you have some many numbers, you know, and uh, there will be restrictions to reach any of these numbers. So uh, I'm really worried, John, about the scarcity of, 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 of metals, of, of talking about mining business. And we, and we talk about the energy transition, we always think about nickel, copper, all of this energy transition metals. But we are talking about iron ore and steel in this session here. And don't forget that we need steel to grow this region. The plant here is amazing, right? Also India, also in many places. So we're talking about the basic development. But not only this, we need to actually decarbonize and there's a lack of high-grade ores to make this happen. We, we have a proven solution that is direct reduction. That is the main operation here in this region. But when you think about the scarcity of high-grade ores, we need to act now. So, again, the first moment uh, we see the possibility to concentrate ores in many places, and not all iron ore can be concentrated to support that route. That is proven. This route is proven. So again, if you ask me what will be the market share of this solution, I can say direct reduction will play a role. But the speed of that depends on the solution of iron ore. And that's our role. There's a lack of 70 million tons of iron ore, high-grade ores, pellet, pellets, agglomerated pro products like briquette that we are bringing this solution now. And we are working hard to make it happen until 2030. But it, from there to 2050, uh, uh, we need more. So uh, that will be the main constraint, one of this uh, part that we are really committed to that. The other part is, is related to the source of energy. So uh, we can forecast 15% in 2050 in a mix of, uh, for hydrogen, a mix of uh, scrapping. At the same time, you can have the DRI with carbon capture, and you can have a remaining production uh, of uh, coal uh, and blast furnace with some natural-based solution to offset. We, we cannot forget that. And thinking about Brazil that I mentioned, uh, uh, we have a privileged situation in Brazil. Mo more than 90% of our source is based on is already based on. Uh, 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 clear uh, clean energy like hydro, solar, and uh, and the valley will reach in Brazil in 25, 100% source of green energy. So this is a privilege. Uh, also, the few have the uh, ethanol as part of our fleet, so we are really good on that. But don't forget the natural base, nature based solutions. So we have Amazon. We we, we need to bring more of this to the table. That can be a solution. All of, all of these will be together to, to solve the problem. It's a huge investment. Competition in the other areas uh, that we will use hydrogen also, not only the steel making, but you have other uh, source of problems around the world. So we need to be together. I, I like that the way you said, uh, all, all of us will be together to have this solution, but all of it, all of these solutions will be in place until 2050. Good. You have a new CEO now coming into place, uh, uh, Grisha. If I asked you that question in 10 years, or even if you want to project to 20, what percentage would hydrogen make up of the Shell portfolio, and does it make money? 
I mean, one of the things that both Shell and BP were faced with is that they were the leaders in transition when it comes to oil and gas players. Then the shareholders start to say, well, where's the profit, right? So how do you strike that balance, and what do you think hydrogen is going to make up of your portfolio? Yeah, I will probably try to stay out of trouble with our new CEO and uh, stay away from a prediction on that <laughs> one. But, but it's <clears throat> because it's, it's, in the end, it has to be profitable, to your point. It has to be able to drive value. Um, and uh, that will de be determined by supply, demand balances, and especially by the acceptance of customers in using it. And it's too early to, 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 to say what percentage it will be. I think for the next 10 years, it'll be more uh, proof of concepts, pilots, um, uh, trying to see also where we as Shell, for instance, can play in the value chain. We're looking at production, we're looking at storage, we're looking at transportation, we're looking at uh, generating demand with consumers as well for hydrogen. So we're playing across the value chain, really. Um, and, and, and we will learn a lot during the next 10 years. And uh, hopefully this will then also help to overcome those cost challenges that I mentioned earlier. And that will then hopefully allow us to scale it up. But to what percentage, I don't know. It'll be one piece, one mosaic of sure. the solution. Um, it's going to be uh, a lot also about electrification and biofuels, for instance. If you look at miners, uh, the feedback we're getting um, is, is uh, if you look at the mobile fleets, which make up 50% of the emissions of, of mining companies uh, on average, that's where you have biofuels available for scope now. One. For scope one. For scope one, and, yeah, for scope one and two, sorry, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you have uh, a biofuel, which is available now. Um, you have um, electrification, which will be available in the midterm, and which gets miners to, to net zero quickly at a, at, at a cost which is comparable to diesel uh, at the moment. Um, so it's a good business case, which at the moment hydrogen is not yet, which is why we don't see that traction there. It could become uh, um, uh, applicable in, in, the, in the processes, and I see it uh, uh, quite to be quite an important lever actually in industrial processing uh, going forward. And I see more, um, um, yeah, if you look at blue hydrogen, especially in the steel making uh, a solution in, in the midterm, um, if you look at uh, other investments that we've made, I mean, we just talked about the one in Oman, we also last year announced um, a big uh, uh, electrolyzer, 200 megawatts, in, in the port of Rotterdam, where we are actually trying to leverage the integrated power. So we're trying to um, uh, use the power that we have from an offshore wind farm in the Netherlands, use that renewable power to produce the green hydrogen, and that we can then again supply to our own assets to help decarbonize them, but also to, to industrial partners or to, to, to the um, road transport sector. And, and um, that integration of renewable energy, and, that, and Alicia mentioned that earlier, and, and the production of green hydrogen, that will be important. I think another important lever to help overcome uh, this challenge of, of chicken and egg a little bit is, is, is really uh, collaborating with others. For instance, we're developing a, a blue hydrogen facility in Rotterdam as well, but we're partnering with 10 partners to help de-risk it. And, and, and um, yeah, collaboration will be key. Building these coalitions of the willing that we mentioned earlier will be key. We talked about scope three, because that's also 90% of your emissions, right, yeah. Marcelo? 98%. 98% in your case, even. Mm -hmm. so, so you're very interested, of course, in trying to sh uh, make sure that that is addressed. And, and that's where the steel makers come into the picture, RK. And, and, and that's where these coalitions of the willing will be really, really... That's a good way of putting it. I remember that terminology uh, yeah. uh, in the Iraq war with George Bush Sr., the coalition of the willing uh, to, to intervene uh, on Kuwait. I wanted to get, spend uh, a minute or two, uh, or the, the time allocated here, to make it uh, a worthwhile discussion. I'd love to hear Alicia's view on this uh, to start, because you're in so many different parts of the world already. Uh, if you look at the legacy of solar and wind, what did we learn on what is the right level of government intervention or a government touch or government policy to make it work. I'm just going to ask for a two-minute intervention each because we're, we're at 10 minutes now. Thanks. Great. Um, well, I think what we learned is that had the government um, stepped in earlier to provide more subsidies, had governments come into uh, solar, for instance, earlier. I mean, Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House. 
and Reagan tore them down. But you know, if we had actually given the type of funding and research to solar earlier, we would have had that drop in cost a lot earlier. Mm. We would be in a place where uh, the cost of energy is, is a lot lower. Is that um, five or 10, what's the usual uh, level of support in terms of duration, uh, do you think? I mean, I think a minimum 10 years because when investors are making decisions, they really need to rely upon the, the policy. Mm. Um, so I think that, that it's really important that the policies do stay in place for a minimum period of time that um, is not just a short window. Um, but uh, I also think it's just, there's all sorts of different types of, of carrots and sticks to encourage industry. Um, right now, Europe has the CBAM, um, which is effectively uh, uh, what Marcella was talking about, uh, which is any product that is made using any type of energy, they basically have a tax system that is based on how green that energy is mm. or what the carbon content is in that actual piece of metal. Um, so in not just taxing or giving subsidies to the energy itself, but the products made with that energy, um, which, which sort of makes the, um, the playing field more even. I mean, and that is the goal, I think, of policy is so that it the first movers and the people who are willing to um, to clean up their 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 areas, <coughs> it, they want to make it easier for them to also compete. So if if you're a first mover and you really want to have uh, decarbonization of everything, it's pretty harmful if everybody else in your industry doesn't care at all. Yeah, I know exactly. Right. So the regulations are really necessary, and one of the areas that I focus on is shipping, uh, using ammonia, green ammonia for shipping. And the IMO has set, um, is going to meet Paris goals in 2100. <laughs> so the, you know, International Maritime Organization is 50 years behind most yeah. of the rest of the industries. Um, but within shipping, there are these first movers and there are groups of them that are moving, they're working together. We're working with them as well to make sure that there are uh, green options for shipping and that they can hit those targets earlier. And I'm hoping, I'm very uh, optimistic in June of this year, IMO will actually uh, set the target to 2050. Yes. That's what we're, we're hoping That's for. been quite a, t a, a, t a tussle. I remember covering it and the, the shipping company saying that's impossible, everything's impossible, uh, but innovation's actually coming as you're suggesting. Now the IMO needs to kind of set harder deadlines. Do you want to use the Indian example? Is it a soft, heavy touch? Is it encouraging uh, RK, hydrogen? What's the Indian government's role? Okay. You know, in India, the government is working with all the stakeholders, including us, to frame a policy. Number one, our prime minister has a very, very high focus on green electricity, green energy, green hydrogen, everything. Now, the government want to convert everything to green, just for example. Now, we are working on wherever we are using fossil fuel including transportation, mm. like railways. Everything has to be green, uh, b basically because they have to operate on green energy. Number two, encouraging and implementing fast trains, bullet trains or some such thing, so that part of the air travel goes down. Mm. So if the air travel goes down substantially, then again we are decarbonizing. So it's a infrastructure which is required to be created so that this fossil fuel burning goes down. This is one. Number two, government is supporting everybody, whether it is steel industry, whether it is for high green hydrogen manufacturing or solar farms, to make investment in them, right type of policies, right type of support, including some interest uh, subsidies and all, so that this infrastructure is created in the uh, country. So this will help in decarbonizing the country. So similarly, uh, like uh, for the e-passenger uh, vehicles, e-mobility, there's a lot of investment which is happening now, and there are targets to the various industries that by such and such time frame, 
we India should be producing so many e vehicles. No, I know it's moved pretty fast, actually. It, it is moving fast. The incentives are there, but the tax incentive, we have to move to the other two panelists, but the tax incentives are there? Are there subsidies? What's happening in hydrogen? No, hydrogen in the sense, uh, it's not a direct subsidy. In the sense, if you want, there'll be very fast clearance. Now, if some financing support, some guarantees are required, government will support. Okay, very good. But Ms. no direct subsidy. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Marcello and um, Grisha, do you want to wrap us up here? What is the right level of, of uh, support, as Alicia was saying, to get this to be more pervasive into the market? Uh, what are we seeing in Brazil, for example, or in the other markets of Ali's present? Uh, I think I could bring three examples. The first one is, is the carbon tax that, that, is, that can stimulate you know, all the efforts and, the, and make this happen. So this is a market that will grow a lot in every place. Brazil is, I think, is behind, but you see in Europe, they are going fast. China will be a, a really real turning point for that. So that's the first thing. The other, you see many places like IRA in the US, a lot of stimulus, specific stimulus to produce hydrogen or carbon capture. So, and we see uh, uh, different initiatives around the world. But the main one, I think, is what happened here in this panel. So uh, I have my friend here that is an expert of carbon capture and how to deal the transition. My client is here. Alicia is an expert of the future. And the arrangement with the private and the public sector is, is, is fundamental. So there's, only, there's not only one design. And I can bring an example that we are calling the mega hubs that uh, we are bringing to, to Saudi Arabia. And we are moving really fast when you have in one side a country that is really want to lead this process, bring incentives in terms of cost of, of, of energy, uh, new technologies, a fantastic infrastructure in terms of, of, of uh, logistics, ports, amazing infrastructure. Again, this is one side. The other side that we can see our clients moving in a direction of a new technology that is totally dominated in this region. And what we can do as a, as a mine company, we can bring the clients for the scale that, that Alicia is, is waiting for and combine everything. So I believe in, 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 in specific uh, uh, stimulus, but before that we need to arrange or organize this supply chain and this solution together in private and, uh, and the public sector. Good, but you also need those incentives. We have less than two minutes left. Uh, Grisha, do you want to tackle it in how you see, because you work around the world, right? Is there a model or two that are doing this right, the, the light touch? Well, we see models where there's uh, zero <laughs> government uh, support, then you are completely depending on on the coalitions of the willing, but definitely government policies and regulatory policies, as Alicia said, also they help because they create that level playing field and it can be the carrot or stick. We see uh, funding of projects, mm -hmm. investment projects, um, which, <coughs> or co-funding, uh, which helps to overcome some of the barriers. We see uh, the carbon taxes that were mentioned here as well. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's really thinking that through, right? It's, it's, I'm based in Germany, for instance, so Germany has a hydrogen, um, uh, strategy now, but it's also not completely there yet, right? Because you need, okay, how do you import hydrogen? At the moment, you're not allowed to export carbon, uh, for instance, through pipelines or something, so you need all these policies to be in place, and that's something we have to work hand-in-hand -hand with regulators as well, because it's a journey that we are all on together and, yes. and, and, and um, joint policy and advocacy across the value chain, but also with the regulators, I think is super important. Good, thanks for sticking to time there as well. I mean, for somebody who's covered energy for so long, you kind of wonder, since the Rio Agreement of 1992, uh, you would say we're living in compressed period of time, but what do we do for the first 25 years of that? Uh, makes you wonder, right? Because the threat wasn't, uh, we spent too much time debating the threat as opposed to moving into the coalitions of the willing uh, and taking it underway. So the level of innovation that's needed today, right? And the capital to make it happen like an intercontinental energy uh, was what needs to come to the fore. Uh, thanks a million. This is a fairly complex issue, but you broke it down in such a digestible way for an industry that's exploring the, the way it goes now. Can we give a nice round of applause to the panel? And I'm going to ask you to exit stage left, and we'll get the next one going. Thank you very much.